And that is whatever you think you have gotten away with, God has always seen. As those who are waiting, join us in worship. I want to remind you what some of you already know, that for this entire month of September, under our banner of Better Together, we have been looking at, listening to, and learning from the Word of God about what it means to be in God-called and God-formed relationships. I've been arguing with you all month long that there really are two types of people in your world, those you allowed in and those God ordained to be part of your world. And although those you allowed in may be good to you, those who God ordained are always good for you. That God has a way of sending people into our lives who truly help us fulfill his assignment and purpose to be what God has called us to be. Uh, you rocked with me when I quoted Houdini, but I am a little bit more moved this morning by a 2007 song with the rapper Fabulous and Neo where he said in the chorus, I'm a movement by myself, but I'm a force when we're together. Mommy, I'm good all by myself, but, but baby, you make me better. Um, that, that God's ordained relationships always connect us to people whose presence makes us better. If you recall, I've suggested to you that, that in order to be better, you need a Barnabas in your life. You need a good friend. You need a ride or die. You need someone that's got your back even when you are dead wrong. The sad story of Scripture is that Paul allowed his relationship with Barnabas to be destroyed because Paul had some personality problems. Go back and listen to series one and avoid being like Paul. And last week, I suggest to you not only that you need a Barnabas, but you need a Ruth in your life. You need someone whose love for you is not connected out of obligation nor expectation. Someone who loves you not because they have to, but because they want to. Someone who's with you even when you can offer nothing other than love in return. Somebody who accepts you as you are and sees what you can be. Everybody needs a Barnabas. And everybody needs a Ruth. Today, I want to add to the repertoire of those who you need in your life and, and build upon our scriptures that have been revealing God-called relationships. Today, I want to invite you back into the Old Testament to see yet another relationship you need in your life. It comes to us from an account recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 12. If you're able to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12, we ask those who are physically able to stand with us as together we reverence the reading of God's Word in 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1. For those that may have difficulty locating 2 Samuel, it's right after 1 Samuel. <laughs> I want to read this morning out of the New International Version of God's Holy Word. 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1. If you've got that, say amen. amen. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it. And he grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this 
must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you the man. <laughs> this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. As we meditate on the word of God, I need you to share the sermon title with your neighbor, but I need you to do it with a little bit of sanctified attitude in your, in your tone, in your look, in your demeanor. I want you to find someone and put a little sanctified attitude and tell them, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. I'm, talking to you. I'm talking to you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm talking to you. To understand Nathan's relationship with David, you've got to go back to your Sunday school class and remember David's relationship with Bathsheba. Although what we read is in 2 Samuel 12, it actually begins in 2 Samuel 5. Because in 2 Samuel 5, David is made king over all of Israel. By God's favor, by God's grace, and by God's goodness, David is elevated to the highest position of authority in all of Israel. Nobody is higher than David. David is king, and all of Israel must obey his beckon and his call. And sadly, Ed, we find out very early on that David is not immune to the temptations of monarchical power. In a real sense, we find out very early on that David cannot handle the authority that has come with the favor God has given him. God has elevated David to such a height of authority and reign and power that David now believes that he is somehow exempt and immune from the laws of God and can use people however he wants to use them. And ain't that the case of folk who gets some power and authority for the first time, <laughs> that many of them don't know how to handle it. Yeah. Beloved, I came by to tell you that there's nothing sadder in life than someone who by the grace of God and the favor of God and the goodness of God have been elevated and they don't know how to handle it. You know the kind of folk I'm talking about. They got promoted and got brand new. <laughs> they were elevated and lost their minds. They got a new title and thought they could treat anybody any old way. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I want you to know that everyone can't handle authority. Everybody can't be a manager. Everyone's not called to be a supervisor. Everybody can't direct a ministry. Everybody can't handle a microphone in their mouth. Everybody can't be the head neighbor in charge. Some people cannot handle favor. 
And I would argue with you as we look at the life of David that the truest test of your faithfulness to God is how you handle God's favor. Judy, the real test of fidelity is not how you walk with God when you're at the bottom, but how faithful to God you are when God has moved you at the top. The real test is not in your poverty, it's in your affluence. It's not when you're in the mail room, it's when you sit in the boardroom. Anybody can worship God at the bottom. Anybody is faithful when they need something. Everybody prays when they're sick. But can you be faithful to God when God has elevated you and God has lifted you and God has blessed you? Um, everybody comes to church when they need God. But can you press your way into the house of God when the only reason you're here is not because you need something, not because you're begging for something, not because you stand in need, but I'm here just to tell God, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Can you handle favor? David proves he can't because with the favor and authority God has given him, David now circumvents the laws of God about marriage and forcefully claims a woman named Bathsheba who is the wife of a man named Uriah. You remember how the story goes down? It's the time for war. And rather than going to war as he should have, David sent his men. And while David is back in Jerusalem by himself, he sees Bathsheba taking a bath on the top of a roof, which was common practice in those days. And David began to stare at what he should have turned from. Br brothers, let me give you some good advice. It's kind of like the NBA. Earl, after three seconds, you got to get out the lane. Uh, David stares a little too long, and lust begins to rise in his heart. And he calls for Bathsheba. And I want you to appreciate Professor Will Gaffney who suggests to us that whatever happens between David and Bathsheba is not consensual. There is a power dynamic, and Bathsheba does not have the right to refuse the beckoning of the king. And whenever a woman does not even have the right or possibility to say no, that is not consensual sexual behavior. According to Will Gaffney, that is rape. David, your beloved hero of Scripture, rapes Bathsheba. Tell somebody, tell them it gets worse. It gets worse. Uh, Bathsheba turns up pregnant. And now David got a show enough problem on his hands because her pregnancy not only threatens his authority and his position as king, her pregnancy threatens his life. Because if Uriah finds out that David has impregnated his wife, according to the laws of Moses, Uriah has the right to demand that Bathsheba, the baby, and David be stoned. David knows his authority is in jeopardy. So he tries to set Uriah up. Has Uriah come home from battle and thinks of Uriah like any other soldier when he's home from battle, the first thing he's going to do is sleep with his wife. And if he sleeps with his wife, David can then pass the pregnancy off on Uriah only to find out that Uriah's got some integrity. And when he comes home, he doesn't go into the bedroom with his wife because his men are still on the battlefield. And he says, I cannot lay in pleasure while my men are fighting in fear. 
Bible says he sleeps at the doorstep of his house. Now David got a show enough problem. <laughs> because sooner or later, this pregnancy going to be found out. Because uh, pregnancy <laughs> is a lie you can't tell. <laughs> so David comes up with plan B. Send Uriah back to battle, but put him on the front line hoping that somehow in battle the Ammonites will do for David what David needs to have done. Uriah's got to be killed. And that's exactly what happens. Uriah is killed. Bathsheba mourns. And after her mourning, David brings her to the palace and claims her as his wife. Seems like problem solved. Issue resolved. Sin swept under the rug. David has used his authority to sin against Uriah and God and thinks he's gotten away with it. But the last verse of chapter 11, verse 27, reads like this, but the thing David did was despicable in the eyes of God. And David's about to find out what I'm going to press on to you today, and that is whatever you think you have gotten away with, God has always seen. God saw what David did, and God sets up in God's mind, I got to deal with this. I've got to handle David. I've got to get David right. I've got to straighten David out. I've got too much on the line with David for David to think he can use his authority to sin against me. God is going to deal with David. And how is God going to do it? Verse number 1 of chapter 12, the very first verse I read, tells you how God's going to deal with David. And verse 1 reads like this, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Let me pause right there. The Lord sent Nathan to David. God has a problem with David. David has got to repent for what he's done. And in order to deal with David, God is going to raise up a Nathan who is sent to David's life to confront David about his sin. This is a God-orchestrated and ordained relationship. Nathan didn't just show up. Nathan was sent by God to confront David over his sin. Can I tell you in the third part of this series, yes, you need a Barnabas in your life. You need a friend that's got your back. Yes, you need a Ruth, someone who loves you, not out of obligation or expectation, but simply because of who you are. And as much as you might not like it, you know who else you need? You need a Nathan. You need someone God can use to rebuke you when your life has strayed outside of the will of God. Let me go on to say that again. You need a Nathan. A Nathan is a brother or a sister God has raised up to rebuke you when your life has strayed outside of the will of God. Earl, I knew when I wrote that sentence, it was going to get quiet in church. We don't like the word rebuke. We don't use the word rebuke. We shun being rebuked. Rebuke has lost definition and practice within contemporary Christianity. We don't talk about rebuking. As a matter of fact, most of us have reached a level in life where someone has the audacity to confront us and rebuke us 
our response is probably going to go like this. Who the do you think you're talking to? And God needs someone in your life who can stand toe-to-toe with you and look back at you and answer that question like this. I'm talking to you. You have strayed, you have fallen, you have sinned, and God has sent me to rebuke you. Someone say rebuke. Rebuke. Rebuking is literally part of our godly assignment that we have towards one another. That when we enter the body of Christ, part of our responsibility in relationship is to rebuke one another when we have gone astray. Look how quiet it gets. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9, a fool hates rebuke, but a wise man is made rich by it. The Bible says in Luke chapter 17 that if one of us has fallen outside of the will of God, we ought to rebuke them, and if they repent, we ought to forgive them. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27 that open rebuke is better than secret love. And when Paul wrote to Timothy as he got ready to die, he told Timothy, this is what I want you to do. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct people, encourage people, and rebuke people. Rebuke is part of our divine assignment in relationship with one another. I cannot say I love you and watch you knowingly and willingly stray outside of God's will. You know somebody tell them I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Kathy, the reason we don't like the word rebuke it's because we really don't understand the definition. We think rebuke is punishment, but rebuke is actually protection. Rebuke is not God punishing me. Rebuke is God protecting me. The word rebuke in literal translation means to beat something back. It means to push something away. So that when God rebukes, God says there's something that's coming on me that I don't discern right now that will destroy me and we got to push it back before it destroys me. That when God sends a Nathan, God is literally trying to save me from something that's going to destroy me. Um, let me give you an example. Um, tomorrow I need you all to pray for me. Um, I've got uh, dental surgery. I've got to go under general anesthesia tomorrow. Um, and I, I have some anxiety about it because uh, I don't like dentists. No, let me, let me not say that because there's some dentists here. I don't like what dentists do. <laughs> um, and then, and, and I, I've got a severely impacted wisdom tooth. Now, Theron, here's the strange part. I'm in no pain whatsoever. I can keep on going. I just not, I'm not taking any pain medicine. I can't feel the daggone thing. I'm 47. If it ain't come out by now, heck, let's just leave it right there. <laughs> and the dentist took an x-ray, and he said, listen, you may not feel it now, but if we don't deal with this now, it's going to cause a severe problem, and by the time you're 55, you're going to have jaw damage, and you won't be able to talk. And you mean I ain't going to be able to talk? This thing got to come on out. <laughs> I've been called to talk. <laughs> and, and so he says, we got to take it out now because if we don't deal with it now, it's going to cause problem down the road. And God loves me too much and is invested too much and cares too much to not deal with something now that will cause me damage down the road. That's why you need Nathan. That rebuke is literally God's way of preventing your self-destruction. When God's hand is on your life, I feel like preaching. When God's hand is on your life, the greatest threat to God's work is never an enemy in your life. 
the greatest threat to the work God is doing in your life? Your own sinfulness. And so the Lord says, in order to prevent you from self-destructing, I'm going to send a Nathan into your life to rebuke that which ultimately will destroy what I'm trying to do in your life. Everybody needs a Nathan. But at the same time, everybody can't be your Nathan. Boy. Ah. Tell somebody, tell them it's about to get good. It's about to get good. Everybody needs a Nathan, but everybody can't be your Nathan. I want to say that because I don't want you leaving church thinking God has ordained you to start Nathan in folk. that you got the gift for calling folk out. <laughs> Nor do I want you to be gullible and think that anybody who comes to you is a Nathan. Yeah. If, if you really hang out in the relationship between Nathan and David, you'll find out that there are some dynamics that help us identify godly rebuke. Yeah. Ooh, can I teach right here? You ain't never heard a sermon on this. What are the dynamics that identify godly rebuke? How do you determine if that's your Nathan? Well, the three of them, and I'm going to be out your way. Number one, I suggest to you that godly rebuke is always preceded by relationship. Godly rebuke is preceded by relationship. Come back to the text, if you will. David is king. And Judy will tell you that means two things. Number one, everybody doesn't have access to David. You can't just walk up in the king's palace. You don't just get an audience with David. Only a select group of people have access to David. And watch this. And because he's king, he doesn't listen to just anybody. You cannot randomly walk into David's throne room and tell him, God told me to tell you, you will be killed. So God has to be selective of who God uses. Someone who has access and someone David will receive. That God doesn't just use anybody because not just anybody can be your Nathan. God uses Nathan because Nathan is in relationship with David already. Because if I don't know you, I don't care what you think God told you to tell me. If I don't trust you, I don't care what you think God put on your heart. If I don't know you like that and trust you and believe in you, you can keep your God thought to yourself. God does not rebuke you through untrusted sources. Come here, come here, come here. Second Samuel 12, that ain't the first time we've met Nathan. No, we met Nathan in chapter 7. When you go back to chapter 7 and you read it and do your homework, you're going to find out here's what happened in chapter 7 that shows you who a real Nathan is. In chapter 7, David has begun dreaming about his legacy. And David wants to establish his legacy by building a palace for the king and a temple for God. David says, here's how Israel is going to remember me. I'm going to build something that generations after me will know I built. And he shares his dream with his council. In that council is a prophet by the name of Nathan. And when Nathan hears David's dream of building a temple and a palace, here's what Nathan says. David, go and do the daggone thing. Nathan then goes home and prays. And God says to Nathan, David can build a palace, but he won't build a temple. He's going to have a son who's going to build a temple, and his legacy will be through his son and not through him. 
So Nathan goes back to David and tells him, I was wrong. I supported you, but God said, you're not going to build the temple, your son will. Now, if you hang out right there, I'm going to share with you three things that help you identify Nathan. Real quick, write these down. I'm going to move fast. Here's how you know Nathan. Number one, Nathan has already proven he has an established relationship with God. One of the reasons David trusts him is because he's found out this is a praying brother. Before you can be my Nathan, I need to know that you are in relationship with my God. I need to know that you have a prayer life. I need to know that you worship God. I need to know that you are serving. I need to know that your heart is open to the Lord. And I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but you got to be in relationship. You got to be progressing in God yourself. Uh, um, Kevin, you can't rebuke me over an issue you got too. You can't call out my sin if it's your sin too. Because if God is talking to you about that sin, he ain't revealing my sin to you. He's revealing your sin to you and telling you, you got to deal with your own stuff before you can call out mine. Can I give you a side order scripture? Jesus said, how you gonna call out her mess when you got some old mess you got to deal with in your own life? Nathan has a relationship with God. Can I tell you number two? Nathan has shown his support for David. That when David wanted to build the temple, Nathan's first response is, I got your back. In order for you to be my Nathan, I need to know I can trust you. I need to know you want to see me win. I need to know you're not jealous of me. I need to know you're not envious of what God is doing in my life. I need to know you got my back. I need to know you stand with me. I need to know I can trust you with what God is doing in my life. If I can't trust you, I can't hear you. Ask somebody, can I trust you? Nathan has a relationship. Nathan has shown his support. But watch this. This is the deepest one. Nathan has proven his humility. Nathan said yes, heard from God, and went back to David, and this is what he said, David, I was wrong about what God was saying. Here's the problem with most people who think that they are Nathans. They are so convinced and convicted by what they think God said to them that they don't have enough humility to acknowledge when they're wrong. That one of the things I need in my Nathan is humility. I can't receive you unless you can also acknowledge you may have gotten God wrong. You're not so holy and so anointed and so discerning that you never mess up on hearing God. In order to be my Nathan, I need to see that there's some humility in your spirit. And brothers and sisters, I came by to tell you, anybody who's convicted enough to confront you very rarely has enough humility to admit when they are dead wrong. You preaching, Pastor. Thank you. Um, Because godly rebuke is preceded by relationship. Can I give you number two? And godly rebuke produces repentance. Here's how you know it's godly rebuke. What's the goal? What's the purpose? What are you trying to achieve by rebuking me? Nathan goes to David and watch this. Judy, his conversation with David It's private. Because Nathan's goal is not to embarrass David. It's not to expose David. He doesn't even threaten David or judge David. Because godly rebuke, the goal of godly rebuke is never to embarrass me. It's never to expose me. 
Godly rebuke can never sound like a threat. Mm. Godly rebuke is never indebted with fear that someone's going to judge me. Godly rebuke happens in a private way that is meant to lead me to repentance of my own sin. Watch this, watch this. So here's what Nathan does. I'm about to teach, sorry to teach right here. Um, Nathan comes to David and he tells him a story. He tells him a story about a rich man and a poor man. Rich man had a large flock of sheep. Poor man only had one. Rich man has a friend come in town. He won't sacrifice any of his multitude. He goes and takes the one sheep that the poor man has. And David is furious. It is a parable. But it's a specific kind of parable. In biblical scholarly language, it's called a juridical parable. I love teaching language. Some will say juridical parable. <laughs> juridical parable is a story that disguises a real-life situation in order to make the guilty party, I should say party, pass judgment on themselves and become self-convicted. Watch it. The juridical parable is a real-life story that's disguised as something else that is meant to make the guilty party come to a place of self-conviction and repentance because what really changes my life is not your judgment and not expose. What changes my life is self-conviction. Real repentance is never born out of fear. Real repentance is born out of self-conviction. And the story that Nathan tells David leads David to a place of self-conviction where he says in verse 13, I have sinned against God. Godly rebuke puts a mirror in front of your face and lets you see yourself. David says, I've sinned. And let me tell you why this is so important. Because this is the first time we see David as king acknowledging where God has spoken to him. When he was sleeping with Bathsheba, he didn't hear God. When he set Uriah up, didn't hear God. When he sent Uriah to be killed, he didn't hear God. And it's not because God wasn't speaking. Because God always speaks when God sees you planning sin. When you are setting sin up, God is always trying to send you a word to say, don't do that. I wouldn't go that way if I were you. But David did not hear that. But now that Nathan is coming to his life, now David is more sensitive to the voice of God and discerning of the will of God because a Nathan not only rebukes my sin, a Nathan makes me more sensitive to the voice of God. Then here's how you know you've had a good Nathan because after you've had him, you don't need him. That after a real Nathan has engaged me, my spirit is now open to hear God speak to me so Nathan is no longer necessary and Nathan no longer shows up because now I can hear God for myself. So after 12, Nathan disappears. A real Nathan is never permanent. Uh, Pastor, you teach it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> godly rebuke is preceded by relationship. Godly rebuke produces repentance. And watch this last one. Godly rebuke proclaims redemption. The danger with rebuke, which is why everyone cannot be your Nathan, is that rebuke can leave you crushed by guilt. Rebuke can leave you crippled, worrying about the consequence. Rebuke can leave you devastated in your spirit. Rebuke can leave you worried about your future. Rebuke can make you carry around a guilt of knowing how much you have failed God. And that's where David is when he realizes that what he's done, God has seen and God is displeased with. David begins to feel the weight of guilt that any of us should feel when we know that God is displeased with us. 
And in the midst of seeing David worried and guilty and crushed, this is what Nathan says, God has taken away your sin. You will not die. Beloved, it's one thing for you to tell me where I'm guilty. It's another thing for you to remind me that I can also be forgiven. And how you know a Nathan, a Nathan doesn't just rebuke your sin and point out your faults and share your misgivings. A real Nathan also reminds you that God still loves you and that there's still an opportunity for you to turn your life around. That godly rebuke doesn't just point out my sin, it points out God's love. It doesn't just expose my sin, it exposes God's forgiveness. It doesn't just call out my sin, it calls out my redemption. Anybody can tell me I'm messed up. Anybody can say I'm jacked up. Anybody can call me ratchet. But a real Nathan says you can be redeemed. A real Nathan reminds me that if I confess my sins, God is faithful and God will forgive me of my unrighteousness. A real Nathan will remind me there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners who plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stain. A real Nathan says, come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Because God loves you. And God has paid the price for your sin. And you can be forgiven. Godly rebuke comes in relationship. Its goal is repentance. But it always proclaims Redemption. Lord, I thank you for the Barnabas in my life, the Ruth in my life. Now, God, may I be open to a Nathan in my life. May I be prepared for when you send me to my David to rebuke them in love and in gentleness. Everybody needs a Nathan. And sometimes we're called to be that Nathan. Thank you, God, that Nathan makes me better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.